Boy Overboard by Morris Gleitzman, read by Natalie Hamilton. <clears throat> this book was written in 2002, published by Puffin Books, and the author has put in a little section for the reader, and it goes as follows. Dear reader, this is a story. It's not about an actual family. It's a story I've made up. But I couldn't have written it without help from the people who so kindly told me about their own incredible journeys. Because I've never been a refugee and I'm not from Afghanistan, I may have got some things wrong. If so, I ask for their forgiveness and yours. I wrote the story to express my sympathy for children everywhere who have, who have to flee to survive and my admiration for the adults who embrace them at the end of their journey. Morris Gleitzman. So obviously, remember when we were talking about this um, the other day, uh, when we had our interactive um, lesson and I was telling you a little bit about the war in Afghanistan and stuff. Um, obviously, this, this section here is just to sort of say his motivations for writing this text and why he decided to do it and how he feels about, about young people fleeing war and all of that sort of stuff. It's pretty extraordinary. All right. The dedication reads for Muhammad, Mazia, Khalil, Razia, Ruhala and Nazia. And hopefully I'll pronounce those names correctly. Chapter one. I'm Manchester United and I've got the ball and everything is good. There's no smoke or nerve gas or sandstorms. I can't even hear any explosions, which is really good. Bomb wind can really put you off your soccer skills. Newcastle United lunges at me. I dodge the tackle. Aziz is a small kid, but he's fast, and he comes back for a second lunge. I dazzle him with footwork. I weave one way, then the other. The ball at my feet is a blur, and not just because the heat coming off the desert is ma making the air wobble. Musa, who's also Newcastle United, tries to remove my feet from my ankles. He could. He's a year older than me, but I managed to avoid his big boots and flick the ball between his legs. You always do that, he complains. Grinning, I duck past him, steer the ball round the mud guard, direct troop carrier, and find myself in front of the goal. Only Yusuf, who's goalkeeper and referee to beat. Yusuf crouches between two piles of rubble, not taking his eyes off the ball at my toes. Over here, Jamal, screams Zoltan, who's in Manchester United with me. Pass! Normally I would. I'm known for it. Ask any of the seven kids in my school. Jamal's a good dribbler, they'll say, and a very brilliant passer. If I had an unexploded shell for every goal I've set up for other people, I could go into the scrap metal business. But this time, I want to score myself. I want to give a desert warrior whoop and smack the ball with all my strength and watch it whiz past Yusuf like a scud missile. Just once. Jamal! Screams Zoltan, flapping his arms like a buzzard with a bellyache. Over here! I ignore him. I decide to shoot low and try for a curve. You have to with Yusuf. He's really good at diving saves, especially for a kid with only one leg. I can hear Aziz and Musa thudding towards me. I steady myself and shoot. Hopeless. I've sliced it, just like last time and all the times before that. The ball trickles towards Yusuf. He doesn't even pretend it's a good shot, doesn't dive on it or anything, just picks it up and chucks it back over my head. Ha, 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 weak, laughs Aziz behind me. Sultan's looking at me as though an American airstrike has hit me in the head and scrambled my brains. Jamal, he says, I was unmarked. Sorry, I say, waiting for him and Aziz and Musa to make unkind comments about midfield players who think they're strikers but aren't. They don't. Nobody says a word. I realise they're not even looking at me. They're staring at something behind me. Their faces are frozen. Their mouths are open. They're in shock. For a horrible moment, I think it's the government. Soccer isn't officially banned, that the government doesn't like people playing it. I think they're embarrassed that we don't have an interna any international stars here in Afghanistan. I turn and look fearfully at the figure behind us. It's not what I thought. It's not an angry man in black robes with a long beard and an even longer swishing cane. 
It's something even scarier. A kid in a very familiar dress and headcloth. Bibby, I gasp. <gasps> Croaks Aziz, face slack with amazement. It's your sister. For a moment there's silence except for the wind blowing in off the open desert and the distant sound of someone drilling bomb fragment, fragments out of their wall in the village. Bibby has the ball at her feet. She starts dribbling towards us. I want to play, she says. We all back away. No, Musa begs Bibby. You can't. Bibby ignores him. I'm sick of being stuck indoors, she says. I want to play soccer. Come on, you soft lumps of camel poop. Tackle me. The others are still backing away and looking at me, and I realise I have to do something. This person pu putting us all in danger is a member of my family. My first thought is to yell at her. Then I remember she's only nine. Two years ago, I used to get distracted and forget things too. Bibby must have forgotten that girls aren't allowed to leave the house without a parent. She must have forgotten that females have to keep their faces covered at all times out of doors. And it must have slipped her mind that girls playing soccer is completely, totally, absolutely against the law. Hold that thought. Hold on. Sorry. <laughs> Do something as his mutters at me. I open my mouth to remind Bibby about all this, then close it. It's no time for talk. She's only metres away from us now, eyes glinting as she dribbles the ball with her bare feet. If a government official out for a walk in the desert sees this, he'll be slashing us with his cane before I can say, she's only nine. And then the government police will come round to our place and drag mum and dad off for not controlling their daughter. Tackle her, I say to the others. They stare at me, confused. Get the ball off her, I say. Now they understand. We all lunge at Bibby without slowing down. She sidesteps Aziz, weaves past Musa and flicks the balls between my legs. I can't believe it. She's remembered every single ball skill I've taught her. That's not fair, I yell as I sprint after her. You promised you'd only do soccer in your bedroom. You promised. She ignores me and heads for goal. Yusuf, uncertain, crouches on the goal line, eyes on the ball. Zoltan has caught up with her. Bibby, he yells, over here, pass. I can't believe it. All Zoltan can think about is getting a shot at goal. Suddenly, I don't want Bibby to pass to him. I want her to have a shot herself. Me, screams Zoltan. Bibby ignores him. Without steadying herself or pausing to pull up her skirt, she shoots. It's a great shot, low and hard. Yusuf dives, but the ball scuds past his fingers and hurtles into the rocket crater behind him. Yes, I hear myself yell. Goal for Afghanistan, yells Bibby. Panting, she gives me a proud grin. I grin back, then I remember. I'm her older brother, and it's my job to be stern with her when she's risking everyone's safety, including hers. Aziz and Musa and Zoltan are staring dumbstruck after the ball, which has disappeared over the other side of the rocket crater. I'm going home, says Aziz. Me too, says Musa. Me too, says Zoltan. The three of them sprint away. I think they're going home to practice in their bedroom, says Bibi. She doesn't seem to realise I'm giving her a very stern glare. I'll get the ball, she says. Then we can play one, one aside with Yusuf in goal. Before I can stop her, she's running towards the rocket crater. Bibby, I yell, come back. Get after her, says Yusuf, still sprawled in the dust. Normally I'd help Yusuf to his foot after a big dive like that, but there's no time. I sprint after Bibby. On the other side of the rocket crater is the open desert. Bibby must have forgotten why we don't go there. It's the end of chapter one. A couple of really good things that are happening in that chapter, which I really, really like. And it's really setting the scene with certain things um, to make us feel like it's not Australia or it's a little bit unusual. And so, for example, um, she calls, you know, soft, she calls these boys, Bibi calls these boys your soft lumps of camel poop, which is, which is pretty funny, which I really like as well. They're playing, they're obviously playing in a really dusty, dirty, um, um, damaged area with rocket craters and all of that sort of stuff. 
and Bibby has turned up and has shocked these boys. And knowing what we know about girls and how girls are, uh, women and girls are treated in Afghanistan at this time and how scared Jamal is and even, and Jamal even saying, saying, then I remember I'm her older brother and it's my job to be stern with her means that it's his job to tell her what to do because he's a, he's a man, he's a boy. And he's the one who has, not just because he's the older brother, it's because he's the brother, he's the male in in all of this, which is which is a pretty important thing. So she's turned up to play soccer and here she is and she's brilliant at it and she's really, really good and, she's, and she saws the goal. We noticed also Yusuf has one leg. Can you guess why Yusuf has one leg? You might be able to predict you know, what was going on and all of that sort of stuff. And he's in goal and the referee and he's, a, and he's like hopping around, which is a pretty interesting image really for that character as well. Don't forget about the essay question that you have chosen for your essay you're going to write. Has something happened in Chapter 1 that might help you with what you want to go with? Don't know. You'll find out shortly. Let's crack on and let's keep reading for Chapter 2 and then I think that'll probably do. They're pretty short chapters. Are you ready? Chapter 2, page 7. Here we go. <clears throat> Bibby, I yell as I scramble up the side of the rocket crater. Watch out for landmines. I can't see her. She must be in the next gully. Stay still, I yell. Don't move. Please, I beg the landmine silently. Don't let her tread on you. She's only nine. This is her first time out here. Be kind. I slither into the gully. Bibby isn't there. Neither is the ball. I can't be blown up or I'd have heard the bang. Incredible. Her shot must have gone even further than I thought. I bet even David Beckham couldn't boot a ball that far. Not over a rocket crater in a gully. Not unless it was in a, in a cup final. David Beckham, for those of you who don't know, was a very, very famous soccer player. He played for Manchester United. Just on an aside. I climb out of the gully and up onto a sand dune, peering into the wind and see Bibby. She's down on the flat desert running towards the ball. Bibby, I scream. Watch where you're putting your feet. She's running through a landmine field. The flat desert goes all the way to the horizon. Luckily, the ball hasn't rolled that far. Luckily, it's been stopped by a tank. Dad's always saying the desert's been ruined by all the abandoned tanks and crashed planes and exploded troop carriers lying around, but sometimes Waterbury has its uses. Thank you, I mutter to this rusting hulk as I tot up toward, down towards Bibby. I'm shaking with relief, but I still manage to put my feet exactly in her footprints. If we both do the same on the way back, I'll be able to get her home safely. As I get close to her, I hear a creak. I look up and see something unexpected. The gun barrel of the tank is moving. Just a fraction towards Bibby. She stops running. My heart has a missile attack. Then I grin as I realise what's going on. <laughs> it's okay, I pant as I catch up to Bibby. When the tank was abandoned, they mustn't have bothered to put on the handbrake or whatever it is that stops tank barrels moving in the wind. Bibi glares at me. What are you doing here, she says. Don't you think I'm grown up enough to get a ball on my own? I sigh inside. When Bibi's feelings are hurt, she usually gets violent. It's not that, I say, thinking fast. I'm just worried about the time. If you're not back home when mum wakes up from her nap and dad gets back, there won't they won't know where you are. They'll panic. No, they won't, said Bibby. I left a note. A note? I say weakly, telling them I've gone to play soccer. My throat is suddenly drier than the rusting hulk's fuel tank. Bibby, I croak, it's really important we go home now and tear up that note. Why, says Bibby defiantly. Girls playing soccer is a big crime, I say almost as big as mum and dad running an illegal school at home. If the government finds that note, mum and dad are in serious trouble. Bibby's face falls. Oh, I didn't think of that, she says. She turns and starts to go back. Make sure you tread in your own footprints, I tell her. I'll grab the ball and be right behind you. I hurry towards my ball, which is lying against one of the tank's 
huge caterpillar tracks. As I get closer, I see the tank isn't rusty after all. It's covered in camouflage paint. I realise something else. That throbbing noise, the one that sounds like the wind vibrating the armour plating, it's not wind, it's the throbbing of the tank's engine. I freeze. My brain shrivels with fear. This tank isn't abandoned. It's parked. I stare up at it, desperately trying to work out if the markings are American or Russian or British or Iranian. Not that it makes much difference. I can't remember who's on our side this year anyway. When I was little and I used to play tanks with empty hand grenade cases, I'd always paint the good tanks white and the bad tanks black. Why can't armies do that? The tank gives a clanking lurch and a loud snort with a horrible screech of metal. The huge gun barrel swings slowly round till it's pointing straight at me. My insides turn to yogurt. I want to dig a hole and hide, but I know tanks have got infrared heat-seeking devices for tracking fugitives, and right now my armpits are like ovens. Run! I scream over my shoulder at Bibby. Perhaps the tank won't shoot us. Perhaps the soldiers inside are just irritable because it's really cramped and stuffy in there and one of them's got a bit of a tummy wind. It's possible, but my legs don't think so. They're wobbling so much I can't even run. Clang. What was that? Clang. A rock bounces off the tank. I spin around. Bibby, eyes big with fury, is hurling another one. You squishy lumps of camel snot, she yells at the tank. Give us our ball back. That's the end of chapter two. What I find really interesting about this is, is that, sure, Bibi is nine and nine-year-olds are annoying and whatever and maybe a little bit ignorant. But what I find really interesting is that she doesn't know, well, she doesn't know that she could get her parents into really serious trouble for playing soccer. Now, there is no way that this character wouldn't know that, but it's a device that the author has used to tell us that, and it's a really important thing. So you've got to suspend your disbelief about that character because it's it, how else is the author going to let us know that, play, that girls playing soccer will get the parents in serious trouble? Oh, and that the parents are running an illegal school. So it's a device that the, that the author has used to give us some understanding. Otherwise, it'd be like a report. Women aren't allowed, and it's not interesting. So he's put it into dialogue so that it makes it makes it better for us. Surprising that the tank and the tank has soldiers in it, enemy soldiers, enemy soldiers in it. So not Afghanistanians um, or Afghans, and so so it could be Americans. So the Americans were there in two thousand and one. Uh, the Russians. So they were there fighting fighting the Americans and the Afghanis that they invaded in the 1970s. The British, no idea when they were in there, or the Iranians, I'm not too sure either. Um, the Brits were kept, went in like we did with the Americans, with the Coalition of the Willing in 2001. So who knows who the enemies are? And I love it that he's just like, can't the good ones be in white and the black ones and the bad ones be in black? It's such an easier way to be able to distinguish who's my enemy and who's not, which is kind of cool. I kind of like that a lot as well. All right, this has probably been going on for long enough. Oh, it's, this is a really good chapter. Can we keep going? Okay, I'll keep going. If you want to stop, just stop, and you can come back to this at another time, I think. I'm pretty sure you can. Work at your own pace. You know what to do. All right, here we go. Chapter three. <clears throat> get down i yell at bibby i fling myself to the ground pressing my face into the dirt bibby stares at me for a moment then slowly lies down buzzard wart she yells at the tank she rolls onto her side and chucks another rock at it stop i scream at her you'll get us killed i'm starting to see why the government wants to keep girls locked indoors something in my face makes her stop we lie still well fairly still. My insides are quivering like goats in a bombing raid. Bibi pulls herself up onto her elbows. Why are we on the ground, she says. If the tank wants to shoot us, it'll shoot us. She's right. We stand up. My legs only just manage it. The gun barrel of the tank is still pointing at us. Okay, I whisper shakily to Bibi. I'll talk to the tank. You turn slowly and go straight home and stay in your footprints. Bibby's eyes flash. I'm not leaving the ball, she says. Or you. 
Don't worry, I say trembling. I'll get the ball. She opens her mouth to argue, but I keep on talking. You suspect there by himself. He needs your help. Bibi doesn't argue with this. That's one of the good things about her. She'll argue about anything, but she'll always help a friend. I watch her set off slowly towards the rocket crater in her own wind-blurred footsteps. I so much want to go with her, but I can't leave my precious ball. The ball I've kept hidden from the government for nearly two years. The ball I've patched up about a million times thanks to all the jagged metal around here. The ball I love like a sister. I turn back to face the tank and see that the ball isn't just resting one of the and see the ball isn't just resting against one of the huge caterpillar tracks. It's half squashed under it. If that tank rolls forward, my soccer ball will explode so badly. Not all the bike patches and love in the world could save it. I know what I have to do. I remember what mum has told me about her ancestors, fierce, brave desert warriors, tall and proud in the saddles of their mighty Arab steeds. She also told me about dad's ancestors, bakers, honest, hardworking bakers, baking bread so that those fierce warriors had something to mop up their gravy but it's my desert warrior ancestors I need to think about now. I try not to show the tank how scared I am. I try to pull myself up to my full height, which next to a tank isn't very high. I try to make my voice sound like a desert warrior. <clears throat> Excuse me, I say. Could I have my ball back, please? Direct but polite. I think that's how a desert warrior would have said it, but with less voice wobble and bladder twitch. The tank doesn't reply. I'm sorry my sister threw rocks at you, I say. Please don't take it personally. She throws rocks at everybody. I pause, hopefully, my heart going like a troop carrier stuck in, a, in first gear. Nothing. Please, I say. I need that ball. Soccer is going to be my career. Please. Plus, it's Bibby's only chance to get out and have fun and escape a life of being kept indoors by the government like all the other girls and women around here. I run out of breath. As I struggle to get it back, I realise that talking isn't going to be enough. It never is with tanks. Trembling, my mouth as dry as a hot bread tin, I move step by step towards the gun barrel. This is what a desert warrior would do, I tell myself. Desert warriors didn't run away from a bit of danger. If their ball got wedged under a tank, they'd just go and get it. I crouch and grab the ball and try to drag it out from under the tank, but the pieces of metal, but the pieces of metal track are thicker than my chest. The bulging ball won't shift. I wrap my arms around it and strain every muscle in my body, scrabbling at the ground with my feet. It's no good, the tank is too heavy. I slump back, weak with despair. Am I kidding? I didn't inherit anything from Mum's ancestors. Bibby got all the desert warrior genes. All I got were Dad's. The strength, courage and fierceness of a baker. Pathetic. Desperation swirls inside me and makes me do a very silly thing. My ancestors were bakers, I scream at the tank. They had really hot ovens, hot enough to melt a dumb tank. I stop. My head throbbing, wondering if I'm going to die. From inside the tank, I hear radio static, then a radio voice I can't understand because my brain's beating too loudly in my ears. Suddenly, the tank gives a lurch. I fling myself backwards in the dirt, waiting for the ball to explode as well as most of my body parts. They don't. The tank is backing away. The engine is howling, the tracks are clanking, and the tank is spinning in a screeching circle. Then it clatters off, leaving me choking in its dust. I grab my ball and hold it to my chest. I love the smell of the leather, even though Bibi reckons it's made from camel. I lo even love the smell of the rubber patches. I watch the tank roar and shudder towards the horizon. Thank you, I croak. I wave, my, but nobody waves back. I stand up, dizzy with relief. I thank my ancestors, even if the desert warriors aren't listening. I know the bakers are... Dad always says, you can trust people who get up at 3 a.m. And he's right. The tank is gone. Everything's okay. Still a good day. Then I hear a scream in the distance. A long, terrified scream. Bibby, 
I turn and start running back towards her. Yusuf is yelling, his voice is high-pitched with panic. Jamal, 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 come quickly. Your stupid sister stepped on a mine. That's the end of chapter three. Page 15. We're going to leave it there for today. So that's that's probably heaps. A couple of really good things in, in all of this. The tank becomes a character of its own and, and he's talking to the tank, even though obviously it's not a person who would respond which is really, really nice. All of this ancestry stuff as well with the desert warriors and the bakers and what does that even mean? I really want you to start thinking about the depth of connection that Jamal has with people from his long, long past and how that might resonate with the people that they are currently and in the, in, in the present time from this text. And again, we've got we've got another contrivance with um, the author helping us understand why why Bibby is the way that she is, and and you know, and what the what the plight of women is in Afghanistan during this time. A um, couple of really nice um, insults in there as well, like you know, buzzard war, and I think there was another camel reference as well, which is which was pretty cool. Um, and there was one other thing. What's the other thing? I can't remember. I think that'll do. All right. So make sure you're taking some notes. Whatever notes you'd like in, in this one, I'd be writing down some of the some of the quotes that Bibi says, some of the things that she calls people. I'd also be writing down writing down how much I like how Jamal treats Yusuf and how um I don't know, the way that he interacts with Yusuf is really quite lovely and how Yusuf was was sort of calling out and helping, wanting to help out with every, you know, and go and get him and all of that sort of stuff. I quite like Yusuf so far in this, even though he's called Bibi stupid because she's done something really foolish. She wouldn't have stayed in her own footsteps uh, where it's obviously a path where there aren't any mines. She hasn't done that and now she's stepped on a mine and what's going to be the next result of that? <gasps> Who knows? Write down your notes. Uh, I'll see you next lesson with another instalment. We'll read another couple of chapters and we'll see how we go. You're also going to have a quiz on these ones tomorrow. So you don't have to do a quiz now, just have to take some notes. All right, that'll do for today. Bye.